<laughs> sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm sorry about the people who are on zoom uh, looks like i was muted uh, yeah so let me just start from this slide again so uh, today's tutorial has two parts i will actually talk about uh, i will give a formal definition of nas and then talk about the nasnet search space and then delve into the details about one shot architecture search techniques in the second half martin will talk about zero shot nas and then some other kinds of algorithms based on transfer learning based, few shot learning based, and learning curve ranking. So given a deep learning model M with architecture alpha and model parameters theta and a data set D with training, training split, validation split, and test split, generally we train the deep learning model in order to minimize the loss this loss can actually vary depending on the kind of task that we're trying to solve. Most commonly for classification, it's cross entropy loss. For regression, it's mean squared error loss. And we try, we try to minimize this loss on the training data. In addition to that, we also try to regularize the parameters in order to avoid the overfitting. NAS actually takes in a particular search space A and a response function F and it tries to find the architecture which maximizes the response function in the given search space. The response function in most cases is computed on the validation split, and in generally it is always a validation accuracy. Rather than searching for all the networks in the whole wide world, we are better off restricting our search to a region that is known to contain well-performing networks. Few things to consider when you're actually designing the search space is expert knowledge, so for example, when we are constructing deep networks, we do know that skip connections tend to improve the training. So in those cases, it is better to codify the skip connection into the search space. And the search space also varies based on the kind of task that you're trying to solve. For example, when, uh, the kind of architectures that you explore in order to deploy them on a mobile device are very different from the kind of architectures that you would explore in order to solve imaginary classification task. There are two kinds of cells uh, search spaces. One is global search space. Second one is cell-based search space. In today, um, in today morning's tutorial, uh, they actually covered this in great detail. For the sake of this tutorial, we'll limit it only to cell-based search space. So whenever a NAS actually searches in the cell-based search space, it looks for two different cells. The first one is a normal cell where the stride is one and the image resolution remains unchanged. The second one is a reduction cell where the stride is two and the image resolution is reduced. So the final architecture is formed by stacking several of these cells on top of each other. This actually shows the internals of the cell. As you can see, a cell is comprised of several blocks or nodes. Each block actually has two incoming connections. On each of these incoming connection, it applies an operation in turn. These incoming connections can come either from the previous blocks or from the previous two cells. Let's take a concrete example. Over here, block two has an incoming edge coming from block one, applies a separable three cross three. And the second connection is coming from the previous cell and it applies a max pool three cross three. Inside the block, these two operations are then concatenated and this forms the output of the block. As you can see over here, um, not not the, the outputs of all the blocks are not consumed. Some of these outputs are left dangling. So all these dangling outputs of all the blocks are actually concatenated together and they form the output of the cell. The main advantage of using cell-based search space is it is very easy to search. It is very easy to transfer the architecture searched on one data set uh, to another data set. For example, rather than searching for an architecture on ImageNet, we can actually use a proxy task such as CIFAR 10, search for the normal cell and the reduction cell on CIFAR 10, and then stack these cells more number of times on ImageNet in order to obtain the final ImageNet architecture. You can also increase the number of filters of these cells. Um, as we discussed earlier, there are several different flavors of neural architecture search. Um, recently, one-shot architecture search algorithms have become very popular. So for the rest of the tutorial, we'll only discuss about these one-shot architecture search-based algorithms. During the search phase of NAS, at every iteration, 
the search algorithm actually proposes a candidate. This candidate is then trained in order to obtain the validation accuracy. And then this validation accuracy is given as a feedback to the search algorithm, which in turn adapts its search, and then again comes up with a new candidate. So the most computationally expensive part of this whole search process is training this architecture every single time. Um, the initial few algorithms based on reinforcement learning and evolutionary based, uh, they were not able to reuse the previously trained candidate architectures. And every time the architecture had, the new candidate architecture had to be trained from scratch. One shot architecture search enable the reuse of these weights amongst all the candidate architectures by formulating the entire search space as a directed acyclic graph. It, it's called supernet. So all, the weights of all the operations in the supernet are shared with each other. Um, let us look at a toy example in order to understand this in more detail. On the right-hand side is a supernet with four nodes. A node J can have an incoming edge from a node I if J is greater than I. And as we saw in the NASNet cell example, um, every edge also has an operation applied to it. For example, if you see this green edge going from one to three, it takes the output of node one, applies an operation such as convolution or polling, and this in turn becomes the output of, sorry, input of node three. On the left-hand side, you will see the, you will see the operations of the supernet. Um, given that every edge applies an operation, the edge can have several, uh, the edge will have all possible operations in the search space, and that is also included in supernet. So in this diagram, the jth column actually refers to all the set of operations applied on all the edges with which are incoming edges to the node J. Let's consider the third column. This third column actually, uh, the first two set of operations in this column actually correspond to the operations on the incoming edge going from node one to three. And the second set of operations correspond to the edges going from uh, correspond to the operations on the incoming edge going from two to three. These operations on the second column actually correspond to the incoming edge going from one to two, so on and so forth. So now that we know that, okay, the supernet has several edges and several operations, let's start sampling the candidates and see how the training actually happens. So we sample our first candidate architecture. In this case, the edges go from node one to two, two to three, and one to four. And the operations are O2, O2, O1, and O2. As this is the very first time uh, any architecture is sampled from the supernet, all these weights are initialized randomly. And uh, uh, when, when this candidate is actually trained, we only train it for one mini batch of training data. So after the candidate is trained, these weights have these weights also have been trained and they inching slowly towards convergence. But as this only trained for one batch of mini data, <laughs> the progress will be very slow. So now we sample the second candidate. Over here, the edges go from one to two, two to three, three to four. The operations are O2, O2, O1, and O2. The only difference between this and the previous candidate is rather than the edge going from one to four, it is now going from three to four. So these three operations were already sampled by the previous architecture as well, and they were already trained. So these weights, rather than starting from random, they're, they're trained from for, they train further from where they were left off. Uh, but as O2, this is the very first time this operation was sampled. This is trained from scratch. Uh, the only difference, now we sample the third architecture. The only difference between the third and the second one is this particular operation, instead of O2, it is O1. Everything else remains the same. Again, as the previous case, these three operations uh, are trained further from where they were left off by the previous two candidate architectures. This one is trained from random. Thus, you can see that the more number of times a particular operation is sampled, the more it gets trained and the closer it is to convergence. So we keep saying that we're training the, uh, we're training these architectures and we're training the supernet, but how exactly are we updating the parameters? So what we do is every time, as we've seen, we sample the candidate architecture and then uh, on a mini batch of the training data, we compute the cross entropy loss or any other training loss that we're using. 
And then the supernets parameters are updated based on the gradients of this cross entropy loss. You back propagate the gradients of this loss to update the supernets parameters. Um, one shot architecture search, because it is able to reuse the weights, it was able to accelerate the search dramatically. The very first algorithm which was developed, which is ENAS, was able to accelerate the search from 360 GPU days to 0.32 GPU days. One thing to keep in mind is the best architecture obtained by these one-shot search algorithm still needs to be trained from scratch before it can be deployed or used for inference. There are several different strategies to sample the candidate architectures from the supernet. Some of them are reinforcement learning based, surrogate model based. You can learn a parameterized distribution to sample from. You can also just use random sampling. Uh, like I mentioned, Efficient Neural Architecture Search, or ENAS, is the very first one-shot search algorithm that was developed. This is, again, uh, a cell, uh, a NASNet cell. Over here, you can see that at every node, the important decisions to make is where the previous two incoming edges are coming from and which operations to apply on these edges. So uh, ENAS actually framed this as a sequence prediction problem, and it used an LSTM to predict it. As you can see here, the LSTM is predicting where the two incoming edges are coming from and which operations are being applied. This LSTM is in turn trained using a reinforcement learning policy. And the reward for this policy is nothing but the validation accuracy of the trained architecture. So when we train the ENAS, we'll have to train both the uh, controller's parameters as well as the supernet's parameters. So we know how we train the supernet in general. So the story remains the same, but when you actually, while you update the weights of the supernet, you'll have to freeze the controller's parameters and then update the weights of the supernet. Similarly, uh, the controllers, while updating the controller's policy parameters, you'll have to freeze the, you'll have to freeze the supernet's parameters, and then you'll have to, you'll have to update the controller's policy parameters in order to maximize the expected reward which as we saw earlier is the validation accuracy. Now, next let's look at the next algorithm which came about, which is DARTS or differential architecture search. In the case of ENAS, choosing an operation at every edge was always a discrete decision. DARTS made it a continuous problem by formulating it as a weighted sum of all the operations on a particular edge. It did so using softmax. So now an architecture is parameterized by these weights, uh, by these operation weights beta, and we call it alpha of beta, but for notational convenience in most cases, we'll just call it alpha, and this alpha is referred to as the architecture weights. The network weights as always remain theta. The magnitude of an operation is given as here. Now let's actually, look at a toy example of that to see how it works. So over here, um, every edge has three operations, O1, O2, O3, and uh, plus is, the node is indicated by plus. And uh, in this particular toy example, every node has only one incoming edge in, instead of NASNet where there are always two incoming edges. But bear in mind, this is just a toy example. So first, the architectures of, sorry, the weights of all these operations are initialized uniformly. As the training progresses, some operations gather more weights than others. Training continues. Then finally, we end the training. So over here, as you can see, this is still in a continuous representation, and this is still a supernet in some sense. We'll have to, we'll have to derive an, an actual cell from this. How do we do it? As we know, um, in the case of ENAS, we'll have to make few decisions. So one is where the incoming edges for the nodes are coming from. And the second one is uh, which operation to choose at each of these edges. So uh, we just saw that DARTS defines the magnitude of an operation. So at every edge, the simplest thing you can do is pick the operation with the highest magnitude. And then um, in general for NASNet, we need two incoming edges. So out of n incoming edges, what you do is you rank all these incoming edges based on the magnitude of the operation on that edge, and then you pick the top two. 
in this case it's an easy prob in the toy example it's an easy problem because we only have one incoming edge for every node we just pick that um this last step after the training when we picking the cell is called the discretization step we'll refer to it later so please keep in mind uh yeah so during the training darts actually performs bi level optimization in the inner loop they just update the supernet weights as we discussed earlier in the outer loop they update the architectures uh, architecture weights by performing gradient descent to reduce the validation loss this uh, this keeps continuing alternately until convergence after that we follow the discretization step to arrive at the final cell there have been several extensions to darts in recent times um, we'll only discuss those those works which um, address the following three shortcomings one is the memory consumption of darts the second one is darts collapse the third one is there some problems with the discretization step let's start with the memory consumption so darts requires us to store the feature maps of all the operations at every edge because it, it because of the nature of its mixed operation this consumes a lot of memory and uh, as a result of which the batch size used to train the supernet is fairly limited thus it takes a very long time to run darts on large scale tasks such as imagenet proxyless nas was one of the first works to actually address this issue so pro in proxyless nas terminology they use operations and paths interchangeably so rather than storing the feature maps of all the n paths in memory they only require one path to be active at a time they are able to do this with the help of binary gates every operation is associated with a binary gate uh, where it only lets the information pass through this particular path and it blocks the information from passing through all the other paths so every every path i is given a path weight pi and uh, a binary gate gi is active with uh, is active uh, with probability pi so the mixed operation now becomes uh, this in terms of the binary gates as is the case of darts um, even proxyless nas performs alternate um, bi level optimization so they update the uh, supernet weights and the architecture parameters but if you notice the architecture parameters are no longer in the computational graph the computational graph is now in terms of the binary binary gates so then the authors actually formulated the gradient updates of these architecture parameters in terms of the binary gates thereby uh, overcoming that problem so now rather than choosing one path from n different paths uh, proxyless nas formulated it as a multiple binary selection task thus it only requires two paths to be active in memory um, and thereby it actually reduced the memory significantly and this was the very first algorithm which was able to perform uh, nas on imagenet in just 8.3 days pc darts took a completely different approach rather than passing all the channels to the mixed weight operation what they did is they passed only a subset of the channels to the mixed weight operation and they concatenated the rest of the channels as it is without applying any operation the number of channels that are passed through this mixed weight operation is a trade off because the more number of channels that you pass the higher your accuracy would be but the longer your training time would also be so this needs to be chosen judiciously equation 9 reiterates what we just discussed so they apply some channel masking and the channels which are chosen by this masking are actually uh, actually go through this the rest of them uh, are uh, concatenated directly um so then uh, at every iteration the, the channels that are sampled keep varying so you know this actually destabilizes the training in order to overcome this they introduced edge normalization edge normalization is actually defined uh, using parameter gamma and this is also nothing but a weighted sum of all the edges which are incoming edges to the node j thus the output of a node of a pc uh, of pc darts 
now becomes the product of nine and this edge normalization. Um, one common problem with all one-shot architecture search-based techniques is they favor parameter-free operations when compared to parameter-based operations. This is because parameter-free operations actually train faster and they're able to converge faster than parameter-based operations. PC darts wanted to at least reduce this bias. So what they did is uh, before, the, before beginning the bi-level optimization for 15 epochs, they just trained the supernet. After that, they uh, started the bi-level optimization. In addition to that, they also claim that because we are only using a subset of these channels that are being passed through this mixed weight operation, that also helps combat this bias. They also claim that because we increase the batch size of the supernet while training, uh, that actually stabilizes the training. The next problem is darts collapse. In this image, every edge actually corresponds, sorry, every box corresponds to a particular edge. And within this, you will see how the operation weights vary as the search progresses. So the black arrow indicates the epoch after which the softmax op, the skip connection becomes more prominent. So as you can see, every edge seems to be having this problem. Although skip connections do not really contribute to the increase in accuracy, uh, they help training the supernet easier. That is why they are heavily favored in darts. Uh, Zella et al. came up with some uh, search spaces, toy search spaces, in order to understand this further. Uh, they came up with so they came up with four search spaces: S1 to S4. In the case of S1, every edge has two operations. The way you pick these two operations is based on the historic data. Uh, every, for every edge, you pick the top two operations on that edge. The second one is uh, second one has operations three cross three and skip connect. The third one has three cross three, skip connect, and zero operation. The zero operation takes in any input and always output zero. S4 has three cross three separable and noise operator. What this noise operator does is it takes in any input and it outputs noise. Uh, they ran darts on all these four search spaces. And as you can see here, S1 and S3 seem to have only skip connect. Um, in the case of S2, most of them are skip connect. In the case of S4, noise should never have been chosen, but they still, yeah, but noise is still chosen by darts. Um, there are several papers which actually discuss how to overcome this issue. Uh, PDARTS recommends adding a dropout after every skip connection. DARTS Plus actually uh, recommends explicitly th thresholding the number of skip connections. Fair DARTS performed an experiment uh, the, as shown in the table. Um, you can see that in the, in the first row, they ran random search, but they limited the number of skip connections to two. The second row, they ran random search, limited the number of skip connections to two, and also, um, and also wanted architectures with at least a certain number of multiply ads. Third one, they ran darts in a search space without skip connect. Fourth one is darts plus Gaussian. Fifth one is first order darts. As you can see, one, two, and three perform better than first order darts. One interesting thing to note is Darts without, without skip connection in the search space performs worse than first order darts. Thus, looks like skip connection is a necessary evil. We do need it, but not too many of them. So <coughs> another reason why skip connection could become dominant is because of the nature of softmax. Like in, in softmax, all the operations are actually competing with each other. Rather than that, maybe we can let all these operations grow independently. Uh, in fair darts, what they did is they replaced a softmax with a sigmoid activation so that all these operations uh, can accumulate weights without competing with each other. We want the sigmoid to tend towards either zero or one because if it is zero, then you turn off the operation completely. If it is one, you the operation is active. 
So then what they did is, yeah, in order to do that, they came up with the loss formulation as shown here. And then they do the usual bi-level optimization. And then uh, finally, after the search is done, during the discretization step, what they do is uh, they just they just pick the operations greater than the threshold rather than using argmax. The third problem is that's discretization. Uh, I'll just take a second. Yeah, like we were discussing, the third problem is that's discretization. So over here, yeah. So what happens is the when the continuous representation, uh, the the continuous representation uh, of the architecture found by darts always has lower validation loss than its discrete than its discrete representation, as shown here. This is because the darts always ends up finding a sharp local minima. So when this continuous form is discretized, uh, the validation loss is a lot higher. So rather than finding a sharp local minima, we want to nudge it to find a smoother local minima as shown here. Uh, in robust darts paper, they further ran darts on the four search spaces that we discussed, S1 to S4. So as you can see here, as the search progresses, the validation error always seems to be reducing. In the middle plot, what they did is this is still in the continuous representation, right? So after every few epochs, they discretize the architecture and they computed the test error. As you can see, after a certain stage, the test error no longer reduces, but it is in turn increasing. In the rightmost box, um, they wanted to understand the relationship between the eigenvalues of the Hessian metric of the validation loss, as well as the generalization error. So what they did is they just plotted the dominant eigenvalue of this Hessian matrix. And they found that as the value of this max eigenvalue keeps increasing, the test error also keeps increasing. They further corroborated this in this plot, where if you see, if uh, the dominant eigenvalue is close to zero, then the drop in the validation accuracy is also close to zero. But if it is fairly high, then the drop in the validation accuracy is also high. So they came up with some uh, suggestions in order to overcome this. The first one is early stopping. So if you, if the ratio of the max eigenvalue from k epochs ago to the current max eigenvalue or the current epoch is less than 0.75, then um, it's better to just early stop. In addition to that, you can just use L2 regularization. You can also use cutout augmentation and schedule drop path. Another way to avoid this discretization problem altogether is to start pruning the operations from this mixed operation gradually until only one operation is left at the end for every edge. So ASAP uh, actually did this using annealing with temperature T. So similar to PC darts, even over here, they train the supernet for some uh, epochs. After that, they start the bi-level optimization. Uh, what they do is at every epoch, you uh, you prune the uh, you prune a particular operation if its magnitude is less than the specified threshold. In addition to that, you also have to keep updating the threshold and the temperature for annealing. They're sorry, yeah, they're able to show that as yeah as the number of operations on every edge keeps reducing, the the search speed also increases. So over here, if you see the, the time taken for every epoch is gradually reducing as the number of operations on every edge is reducing. Even over here, uh, they showed that the yellow plot actually corresponds to darts. They also showed that the there is a validation accuracy drop during the discretization step of darts, but there is no drop uh, for ASAP and ENAS. Yeah. Uh, this is a DARTS PT paper that uh, Colin was talking about. Uh, so these guys actually question the efficacy of these architecture weights altogether. So 
in this plot once again every block uh, refers to a particular edge so what they did is they plotted the 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 blue plot actually refers to the architecture weights of a particular operation and the orange plot refers to the accuracy of the architecture when this particular operation is chosen on that edge so so far we've always assumed that these two plots should be correlated but if you see over here um, in the case of max pool the operation weights are very less but the validation accuracy when max pool is chosen on that edge is fairly high and compared to compare that to dilated convolution phi cross phi where the architecture weights are very high but the validation accuracy of the architecture is very low and this seems to be the case for all these three ed edges what they performed another experiment where they took the s2 search space that we discussed about earlier they ran darts on that and then um, they performed two different kinds of discretization one is the usual magnitude based discretization that we uh, discussed earlier that that's what has been done in the original darts paper and for the second one what they did is for every edge they chose the operation which actually yields the highest validation accuracy so they no longer chose the magnitude but they were selecting the operation based on uh, what validation accuracy the final architecture is yielding so if we choose that kind of discretization then you can see that se several of these skip connections are now replaced by separable 3 cross 3 so another thing that they noticed is uh, when you actually convert a mixed operation on a particular edge, when you replace that with a single operation, the supernet becomes unstable. In order to stabilize it, it is recommended to fine tune the supernet for few epochs and then continue to replace a different edge mixed weight operation with a single operation. So generally what we've done so far is we replace the mixed weight operations on all the edges at the same time. But over here, they recommend doing it one step at a time to fine tune it a little and then replace the mixed weight operation of a different edge. So the way they did it, um, so their algorithm is as follows. So you first train the supernet using usual darts algorithm. And then during a discretization, you randomly select an edge. So um, you want at every edge, what you want to do is you want to select the operation which when removed from the mixed operation results in the maximum drop in the validation accuracy and then you fine tune this supernet for few epochs to make sure it's stable and then you sample a different edge and continue this process so over here again um, they actually wanted to show that uh, the perturbation based selection is more stable than the magnitude based selection as you can see over here, what they did is they kept running darts. After every few epochs, they sampled the supernet and then they performed both kinds of selection. So as you can see, in put, there, is, there is not much of a drop in perturbation-based selection, whereas there, there is constantly a drop in magnitude-based selection. Further, as we don't seem to be using the architecture weights at all, they also wanted to see what will happen if we just fix the architecture weights and not learn them at all? So if you see over here, um, darts plus PT is there, uh, is the results where the architecture weights are also tuned. Fix is where they fixed it. So for darts search space, darts PT and darts PT where the um, architecture weights are fixed are very close. And for all the other cases, like NAS bench 201 and these three, um, Dance plus PT, where the architecture weights are fixed, perform better than all the other cases. Now, let's discuss another problem that has been plaguing all the one shot architecture search algorithms. Uh, so, generally, what um, in one shot architecture search, what we do is we keep sampling these candidate architectures, we train them and obtain the validation accuracy. So, the assumption is the ranking based on this validation accuracy obtained from these one shot when these algorithms are uh, sampled from the supernet is highly correlated with the validation accuracy that is obtained from these architectures when they train from scratch 
So uh, you et al actually wanted to see if that is indeed the case. So they actually, what they did is uh, they chose NAS Bench 101. This is one of the publicly available benchmarks. Um, even in the morning's tutorial, they refer to this. So this benchmark actually has um, three operations and seven nodes. This is a slightly reduced search space when compared to the original Dart search space. What they did is they ran um, several NAS algorithms on the search space. So they ran DATs. Now is a, a surrogate model based um, one shot search technique. So what they did is they ran this now on DNAS with and without weight sharing. So as you can see, the standalone counterpart seemed to be performing better than their weight sharing counterparts. And none of these algorithms were able to find the best performing architecture in that search space. Because in these uh, in this benchmark, we explicitly enumerate all the architectures and their accuracies. We know that we know the best possible accuracy of an architecture in that search space. Further, what they did is they wanted to see the ranking of these um, architectures when they're sampled from the supernet versus the ranking of these architectures when they're trained in a standalone fashion. As you can see over here, the Kendall Tau correlation. Keeps, uh, keeps getting worse as the number of nodes in their search space keeps increasing. Uh, Bender et al. came up with some uh, other suggestions in order to make sure that this ranking gets better. So what they recommend, uh, what they've noticed is when we actually train the one-shot model, all the operations in this one-shot model are subject to co-adaptation. Also, when we remove this operations from mixed operation to a single operation, the performance deteriorates. So what they recommend is adding dropout after every single operation using host batch normalization and also applying uh, L2 normalization only for the operations which are selected rather than all of them. So they actually wanted to see how, how using these tricks mentioned here would uh, help in improving the ranking. So as you can see, uh, when you use the techniques mentioned by them, the, the correlation seems to be much better. So what they did is they just randomly uh, sampled 2000 architectures, trained it in a, uh, trained the, uh, sorry, they randomly sampled this 2000 architectures from a one shot architecture from a supernet. And then they also sample, uh, they also trained them in a standalone fashion, and then they were able to compute this correlation. Um, the last part of my talk, I wanted to talk about two other interesting NAS algorithms, which are also one shot based that we couldn't get to. Um, as we don't have a lot of time, I'll just quickly touch upon them and then hand it off to Martin. This is a once for all network. Um, even in the morning, they talked about it a little. So, so far, all the one-shot architecture search algorithms, when the final architecture is obtained, the final architecture still had to be trained from scratch before it can be deployed. But in the case of once for all network, as the name suggests, uh, once for all actually trains a very large network from which uh, candidates of varying architecture configurations can be sampled. And these uh, candidates can be deployed directly and they don't require any retraining. So what happens is, uh, how do you go about this? So you train the largest possible uh, configuration of the architecture. Then you also want to support the architectures with smaller configurations. They support architectures with varying depth, kernel size, number of channels, etc. So I'll just give a, quick example of how you can do, how you can obtain candidates with varying depths and not going into too much detail about the others. So they use progressive shrinking. As we mentioned, you first train the architecture with the largest configuration. And then what you do is say you want to obtain candidate architectures with depths varying from say D1 to Dn. So what you do is uh, you actually choose. So if you arrange this D1 to Dn in a sorted order, increasing uh, order, then what you do is you pick DN and then you choose the first DN layers of this uh, once for all network. 
you place a classification head over there and then you fine tune the sub network so now you can also uh, so now you have a candidate with depth dn ready so then in order to apply in order to uh, obtain the architectures with smaller and smaller depths just keep moving a classification head higher and higher and fine tune the smaller sub networks now you have this once for all network which also has these candidate sub networks with varying depths that can be sampled and directly deployed based on the yeah based on what you want so this once for all network also uh, helps us uh, it it also supports us uh, to deploy the architectures on several different kinds of hardware such as gpu based mobile based and tiny iot devices so the last algorithm that i wanted to discuss which is which is a little different from all the others we've seen so far is unsupervised nas one thing to note is in this case the the unsupervised is only limited to the search so when the search is actually performed they do not use any label data but in order for us to actually use the final architecture we still have to train it on the label data and then deploy it somewhere so the way they've done is very simple so they've taken some three self supervised tasks the first one is rotation based where you'll have to predict um if the image is rotated by 0 degrees 90 degrees 180 degrees or 270 degrees so this is a classification task the second one is a colorization task where you give it a black and white image and the network has to predict uh the color for the image the third one is solving a jigsaw puzzle where you take the whole image uh, or a subset of the image uh, break it into nine different parts shuffle these parts the network now has to predict the correct permutation to put these uh, pieces back together so then what they did is uh, they actually noticed that sorry if this image is too small so what they noticed is the accuracies of the architectures which are uh, trained to perform these self supervised tasks uh, if you rank them they highly correlated with the architectures when they rank based on the cfa 10 and imagenet classification accuracies so then what they did is uh, they ran darts but rather than using the usual supervised classification for cfa 10 what they did is they in turn used these self supervised tasks for darts so darts is now optimized on these three different self supervised tasks and uh, they run uh, so this actually shows the results of darts when on imagenet 1k so what they did is they ran darts on different data sets such as imagenet 22k and city lands uh, cityscape segmentation data and what they did is they they transferred the best architecture obtained on these data sets on Im uh, to imagenet 1k and these are the results on imagenet 1k so yeah as the paper suggests they wanted to see if labels are actually necessary looks like we don't really need labels for neural architecture search but unfortunately to perform the actual classification for the model we still need them to train the final architecture uh so this actually brings an end to my part in uh, so far what we've seen is the nasnet search space we have discussed about enas darts and then some pitfalls of darts and then some problem with the ranking of one shot architecture candidate algorithms and also uh, some other flavors of nas now i hand it over to martin uh, so we are 10 minutes late so i just keep going um so for the rest of the talk i will basically talk about zero shot nas um and transfer learning some techniques that try to make it even more efficient than the techniques we saw earlier um so i guess one of the question is what is zero shot nas and yeah well what is the difference between transfer learning and i think you will see later that this might sometimes be the same so i think most agree that zero shot nas basically means we don't train on the new data and often times what we would come up with is some training free score which we maxim maximize instead of the validation score and um the following methods at least um they 
depend on intrinsic properties of the architecture and or the data. And one obvious question is, of course, if we only need a few hours to search an architecture, why do we need to be even faster? And one of the applications you can think of is um, all that hardware awareness, where we would need to deploy on many different um, devices and we would need to run NAS multiple times. So then it might come uh, no longer feasible for you. Um, before going into the zero shot methods, some background on neural network expressivity. So there's one specific way how people measure that. Um, so as you probably know, uh, neural network, when you use only ReLU activations, this is basically a piecewise linear function, uh, which means that it divides the input space into these nice convex polytype uh, polytopes you see um, uh, on the, the image below. And um, so these are linear regions. And um, how you do you measure the expressivity? Basically, the number of these regions um, basically measures it. So the more of these regions you have, um, the, the more expressive your network is. And this basically grows um, uh, exponentially with the number of layers. Um, so there's another um, yeah, term that I want to introduce, which is the activation pattern, which is actually very simple. Um, basically, an activation pattern is like a string containing zeros and ones. And the length of it is Na. That's basically just the number of activations we have. And um, all these different regions have their own activation pattern. And you can actually compute it very simple. So I, I tried to make up an example here, which I um, took from the paper. Um, so you would have your input space, let's say it's 2D, and we have some simple uh, neural network. Let's say we just look at the first three activations over here. Then for each of these um, neurons, you could divide the space into two different parts. There's the white part, uh, which would get a zero. This is where your activation basically doesn't fire, so its output is zero. And there's the blue part where it's non-zero. And you can do that basically for each neuron dividing the space like that. And if you combine them, you, you get these um, polytopes we saw earlier. And now each of them has this activation pattern of length three, because we have three neurons. And basically, if we look into the lower left area, you might already see what's happening. Um, so basically, the first neuron is firing at that region, the others don't. So we have a one, zero, zero. And in that way, you can basically give each of these regions um, the activation pattern. So it will be basically a vector with ones and zeros on. Um, so that leads us to the first um, zero shot method, which is called uh, NAS without training. Um, here, the assumption made is basically an architecture is better if already without training it. So with random initialization, um, the data is separated into different of these linear regions. So this is what they want to measure with their NAS board score. So first of all, you would take typically just a part of your data and compute these activations pattern we saw on the previous slides. So you would get a lot of these vectors with ones and zeros. And now you would construct a matrix K where the entry IJ is basically nothing but the number of activations you have in total uh, minus the number of uh, times the activation pattern I and J um, are different at a location. And then what you can compute is the determinant what does that mean computing in the determinant is basically just a measure how different the activation patterns are. So if they are uh, um, more different, this would give you higher scores. And in that work, they also looked into basically how these metrics look like and how that uh, um, relates to validation accuracy. And what we see here is basically um, that good performing architectures look like an identity matrix, me meaning the determinant is higher. And if it's not, you would basically get more color. I'm not seeing, yeah, you can see it. Um, so that means the determinant is low. So um, these are a couple of plots on the different um, data sets and search spaces, where the authors basically try to figure out what's the correlation between validation accuracy and this NASWOT score. Um, and what you can see is um, that there's some correlation. It's certainly not perfect. And I think the most interesting area is basically on the top right. Right, because eventually we want to maximize that score. And so the one with the highest NASWOT score should 
also have a good validation accuracy. You can already see that does not work perfectly. However, uh, keep in mind that computing this is super fast. Um, so there's certainly a trade-off here. Uh, different of these zero-shot methods is Zenscore. Um, it's based on a very similar idea, also related to these um, uh, linear regions. Um, they argue that basically it does not only matter how many of these um, linear regions you have, but it also matters um, how complex they are. Um, so basically they, they uh, make use of two facts. First of all, neural network is basically an ensemble of uh, linear models. And second, um, that the Gaussian complexity um, of a linear model is lower bounded by the Frobenius norm of the weight vector. And um, based on these two facts, you can basically come up with the Gaussian complexity of a network, which is defined here in this equation. Um, and that's what they basically then use to compute the Zen score. Um, I make here some, some um, simplifications. So if you check the paper for details, the Zen score is not exactly defined like that. So they would like to compute it, but practically it's a little bit difficult. So they come up with some tricks to estimate it. Um, one important part is also that you cannot compute the Zen with arbitrary architectures. So what they suggest is removing um, things like um, skip connections before computing the score, uh, which obviously means that you can't look for those parts in your architecture. Uh, yeah, this is just um, some study comparing different zero-shot techniques. Uh, including the Zen score and the Naswat score. Um, we see it's certainly outperforming at least random for the ones we discussed. Um, as this table also shows you that zero shot can fail. Uh, and the right table basically shows you that these are rapid fast. So we see like evaluating just a single architecture that, that's like a fraction of a second, um, even though they argue they are much faster to so the Zen score than the others. But yeah, sure. Um, the, the main point is zero shot is really fast compared to evaluating it. Um, that's the main point. And, and the great thing about this Zen um, paper is also that they look into this really relevant application of basically doing it for hardware and where NAS, where I really see only the only reason to use these techniques. And uh, the nice thing is, so they really can now look for architectures on these different devices quickly. And um, they compare against um, a couple of handcrafted architectures that of course were not optimized for that specific device. Um, so there's certainly the, the possibility to improve over that and that's what they show. But obviously if you would run a NAS uh, from scratch, you might be able to beat Zen, but that's not the point here, right? point is showing that you can do it uh, really fast on many devices. Um, so that leads us to the next point, uh, which is transfer learning. And uh, as we will see in the first methods, it's sort of related, at least some of these methods. So what's the motivation here? Um, so all the methods we looked into so far basically um, tackle the NAS problem independently, right? You keep solving a similar problem over and over again, but you don't really reuse any knowledge. Um, so basically starting from scratch uh, over and over again. And the obvious question is, why do we need to do that, right? We always learn from data. Why don't we do it in that case? Um, so the question is, given some source task where we ran our search before, um, is it possible to transfer from that somehow for a new NAS problem so we can make it fast? Um, so here is some background study I did to, to give you an idea that this is actually possible. Uh, so on the left side, we basically see, um, I believe these are like 200 architectures evaluated on C410 and 100. Um, some scatter plot showing what um, test accuracy they obtain. And we clearly see a strong correlation, right? So if you would pick the best one on C410, that's one of the best one on C400, which probably not so rising since these data sets are very similar. But on the right side, you basically see um, the correlation between a couple of five different data sets. And they are, can be fairly different, but even there we see a strong correlation across these tasks. Um, maybe SVHN and Fashion Amnest are here the big outlier uh, where this is close to random, but still slightly positive. 
So that should give us some strong motivation into looking into transfer learning for NAS as well. Um, so yeah, the obvious question is how can we do that? Um, so I want to discuss a couple of ways how to do that. Uh, one is the obvious way I would say, where you basically add this piece of doing transfer learning directly to your search method. Um, another interesting one is also the idea of doing few shot learning, uh, where we basically combine your architecture search with meta learning. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about um, how we can use um, transfer learning also as part of, part of learning curve prediction. Um, so yeah, let's start with uh, the more obvious way of doing that. And this is basically also a zero shot method. So um, top is the first one. Um, we discuss about so here what we would do is we basically also learn a score which allows us to score architectures which we want to maximize to find the best architecture and this score we can compute very cheaply but instead of doing it like in the previous methods where we would use some properties of the architecture we would learn a surrogate model based on previous data which would give us predictions how well an architecture would perform on the new data um yeah so how does it do so what the um, authors basically suggest is that you would learn the surrogate um only on the metadata that is coming from data sets most similar to the task you want to find an architecture for so the obvious question is how do we measure, measure task similarity which is not that obvious um what they are basically doing is they use a very small network which you can train cheaply which will give you a validation accuracy and you would have done that with all the different tasks you have seen before. And what they would now basically say is that if a data set has a similar validation accuracy, then this would be a uh, similar data set. Whether that's true or not, that's a different question. Um, but that's how they do it. And so what they did is they um, used 11 data sets and eight data sets generated from ImageNet um trained 800 architectures on those and they did it actually in a very specific way by training them incrementally by adding one layer after the other so you would start with one layer train it until convergence add another one train it until convergence why did they do it that way um the main reason is they uh their method basically works that way that you would um crawl architectures layer by layer so they would also need metadata um that, that uh, suits their perfect, uh, purpose. Um, so the surrogate model they are using is um, fairly similar, uh, simple. So they basically use a two sec um, an LSTM with two layers. Um, that LSTM would get as an input the. Let me fix that. Oh, oh. help. <laughs> No, it's plugged in, but apparently the power source isn't plugged in. So there's no red light. Yeah, I guess you have five minutes to figure that out. I can keep going. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's wrap that up quickly. Um, so yeah, so the, the LSTM would get as an input the, this DCN score, so basically the measured um, validation accuracy, um, but also, of course, the, the architecture we are making predictions for. And then, as I mentioned earlier, what you would do is you start with the most simple architecture with a single layer. You would, with the surrogate model, basically check all the options you have for adding another layer. And based on your predictions, you would add that layer and you would keep growing the network like that. Um, it's long enough. Thank you. Um, um, so yeah, this is a small ablation study, um, where they basically have on the right side the surrogate model as they um suggested to use it, and then we have like um different components, one of them being uh, feeding the DCN score as part of the surrogate model as an input, and the LDE filtering that basically refers to, um, yeah, working only on a subset 
of the metadata, which is most similar with respect to the DCN score. And what we see is that um, improves performance in the experiments. And what they then did is using the surrogate, basically, as we've seen in the zero shot methods before, use that as a score to quickly perform neural architecture search. And they used, I mean, you could basically use any way of doing that, but basically they rerun um, the, the results by Real et al, the large scale evolution image classifiers. Um, they just rerun that um, evolutionary algorithm using their scores. And that obviously, um, yeah, gives you much faster an architecture where they had to trade off a little bit with respect to accuracy. Uh, another method that's more recent, um, but it works very similar to TAPAS, is rapid NAS. So what you would do here is you have two components uh, where you at first would use some graph generator that you would have trained similar like the one in TAPAS before, which can conditioned on the raw data, generate you neural architectures, which are most likely to be performing well on your data. And then on top of that, you would have a surrogate model that now goes to the sampled architectures and ranks them according how well the surrogate predicts they would perform. And then you would evaluate the top K ones and choose one among those. Um, so how do the different components look like? So for sampling, what you would do is you limit basically the data you train on, on only those architectures which are good because our samplers sh should learn how to sample well-performing architectures. And then this sampler has two components, one being the data set encoder, which takes basically the raw data as input and um, yeah, embeds that into some representation. And then you would ha have on top um, architecture sampler that goes from this embedding to the architecture. And uh, on the bottom, we basically have on the left side, what we see here is how well the embedding is actually able to separate different tasks. All the tasks you see, or all the data sets that you see here are test data sets, meaning they haven't been seen before. And we clearly see um, that they are separated in that two dimensional um, embedding. And on the right, side, around the right hand side, we see how well the generator performs, right? So as a baseline, we have randomly sampling architectures um, and in blue, um, we have the sampling of the generator, which isn't perfect, but it clearly is able to um, sample better performing architectures. Um, yeah. And then the second piece is obviously the surrogate model, um, which shares that component of the data set encoder, but then top has the graph encoder, which takes the graph representation of the architecture as an input and would then simply predict the validation score and which will allow us to rank the sampled architectures. Um, so here are some results. Um, they are mostly taken from the paper. I've added just a simple baseline and I think this is something that you would you should always compare against when doing transfer learning. Um, so basically what they did is um, for these two data sets C for 10 and 100 they were ta taken from the NAS bench 201. Um, and their metadata was mostly from uh, from data from ImageNet data. So what I basically did is I took the third missing data set from NASBench 201, which is ImageNet as well, took the best architecture, and just checked how well would that perform on C for 10 and 100. And I think that's something you should always add because that's super simple, zero search time. And um, what we can see clearly is that even though rapid NAS is doing fairly well, um, that's still a competitive baseline. And what you should also keep in mind here, sorry that I'm a little bit critical, but I want to make that point clear, um, is that rapid NAS reports 69 search time, but in fact, they evaluate the top 30 models, meaning that is on top, right? So even though they claim a fast search time, that's not, perfectly true, right? Considering these additional, um, they, they might not even be um, the, the competitor methods. Um, yeah, I'm not sure we were a little bit late. Let me check. 15 minutes. Um, okay. Um, so this one is 
maybe a little bit different. So, so far we basically have seen only transfer learning for zero shot. Um, this is a method that, um, that has a little bit of a feedback loop, like uh, what you know from BO, where you would sample some candidates, evaluate it, update your prior, and then sample something new. And what you would do here is um, the same idea. Uh, and this method is based on um, basically some sort of weight sharing as well, where let's say you have a surrogate model that is your function GI. And um, the idea is to separate that into two parts, one being a function GU, uh, which you would train, like uh, its parameters you would train across all the tasks. And then each task would have some task specific parameters, which you would only train um, on the new tasks. So whenever you start with the new problem, you would um, use your GU basically as a surrogate. And um, then as soon as you get feedback, you can use that to update your prior belief over um, GI um, by, by learning this RI. And that would allow you to overcome something like um, negative transfer as well to some point. Um, so basically that was applied. So I'm skipping a little bit over these slides. So this was basically applied to now, um, assuming that you're aware of that. And what you would do is you basically would replace the linear layer that existed in now here with this construct and then would pre-train the architecture autoencoder as well as that piece um, based on prior information. Um, that will give you two important advantages. First of all, your autoencoder would be pre-trained, right? In the original now paper, you would randomly sample um, candidates to actually get a useful architecture autoencoder, which is essential because you need to be able to reliably decode architectures. And on top of that, it would give you um, more useful predictions. And we can see that in this table um, where the main important comparison is basically the comparison between transfer NAS and now, um, where we see the, the performance with respect to the small, smaller model sizes is about the same, um, but requires less training. Um, same holds true for the larger model sizes. A comparison um, against these different transfer methods is a little bit harder, unfortunately, because each of them uses their own search space. Um, so I don't want to make any comments with respect to that. Um, I've also added the, the, the baseline, um, which I mentioned we should always add, where I simply, so this is on C410, so I use um, the best candidate on C400 and see how well that does. And there, there is a more significant lift here. Um, so yeah, the next one is, um, yeah, based on MAML, model agnostic meta learning. So I guess you all know that I just want to repeat quickly. So here the idea is to basically, um, learn a representation on a couple of tasks, which allows you to efficiently solve the few short learning problem. And how do you do that? If you have three different tasks where the optimal sub, um, solution is at theta one to theta three for each of these three tasks, then you want to visually get like a representation that lies right in the center. So you need only very few update steps to end in that solution. And the hope is that for a new few short, um, uh, for a new problem, that task would also lie somewhere near the other tasks. Um, yeah, and you can combine the same thing actually with um, dots, which we saw earlier. And this is what Tina's basically does. Um, so given these multiple tasks, what you would do is you would now solve the bi-level optimization we saw earlier in that tutorial uh, with MAML um, to estimate values for alpha and um, W. And then whenever you see a new task, you can basically fine tune your weights with respect to alpha and um, W. And so the, the, the change with respect how to do it um, doesn't really change much in the pseudocode. So you would clearly see it behaves like a MAML uh, plus dots where you then have basically the standard MAML algorithm plus this bi-level optimization piece of we saw earlier in dots. And so the authors evaluated that um, on ImageNet in the one-shot and five-shot few-shot learning setting and reported quite nice results here. 
And keep in mind, basically, the main advantage to most of the other methods is basically that we are additionally learning, uh, meta learning um, these architecture weights. Um, last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about learning curve ranking with transfer learning. So motivation is still the same, right? We want to efficiently um, optimize hyperparameters or neural architectures. Um, what humans, or I guess everyone in the room probably uh, already did is that when you have a new model, you manually tune your hyperparameters. Then what you do is you start with some hyperparameters, they perform well. Um, now you try some others to beat that one. And if you do it manually, you don't have the time to finish until completion. So you track the learning curve and it does look promising. You keep going, otherwise you terminate it early. And there are a couple of methods that automatically do that for you. And that is, of course, a very good idea. Um, one of yeah, the most common ways of doing that, which is also done in um, successive halving, for example, is that you would use very simple statistics, which could be the median, the mean, or simply the last observed value in the learning curve. So let's say you have some learning curve which performs at the moment the best. You, you start training a new one. And uh, at some point it is below the, the current best solution. And that's the point where you basically stop training and try another one. Um, that has a couple of shortcomings. For example, if you have some architectures which actually turn out to be the best ones, but they need more time to actually um, provide these good accuracies, you would um, terminate them before they can reach that, uh, that potential. And what you would also have is that there might be some bad architectures, which in the beginning um, get high accuracies, but yeah, then turn out to be bad. And you would keep start training these all the time um, and wasting your compute on them. Um, so one way of addressing this is that this whole chapter on learning curve prediction. And what you typically do here is give them some partial learning curve. So you will see the first few epochs you try to predict how well that learning curve will do in the end. And then you typically combine this with some heuristic to get the probability that a new configuration will outperform your old one. And if this probability is below some threshold, you would stop it. Um, so the idea in learning curve ranking is basically to come up with this uh, probability directly with the model. Um, so what we did, is basically um, use something very well known in the learning to rank community is we model that probability as shown here in equation 18, um, where the, the probability now, so basically this output depends on two inputs, like the two candidates we look into. And we also see um, some function f, which is a neural network we will discuss on the next slide. And we would estimate the parameters of that um, function f by minimizing and the cross entropy loss shown in equation 19. So what does the uh, function look like? Um, that really depends on your problem. So in our case, we looked into a neural architecture search. So we had some sort of architecture that we would need to encode. Obviously we would have the learning curve, uh, which we fed into uh, some 1D convolution. And then you might have some additional hyperparameters, which we only pre-processed. Um, so yeah. One of the problems when learning one of these models is that they are parameterized and you need uh, data to estimate these parameters. One solution we saw earlier to overcome that, if we don't have data, we can just not use any parameterized models. Um, the other solution which is commonly used is you would start collecting data at first, which then means you spend some commute, uh, compute on doing that. Well, as soon as this is in part of the transfer learning section, you can already guess what's happening. Um, so what we did is basically use transfer learning to, to, in order to overcome that problem. So that leads to a minor modification of the neural um, network. So because now we also learn a data set embedding to differentiate between the different data sets. But well, that's about it. Um, so we ran some experiments on five different data sets. Um, on each of them, we basically evaluated 200 architectures, trained them from 100 epochs, and then evaluated it in a leaf one data set out cross validation. Um, so in this first study, uh, we looked into how well this learning curve ranking actually performs 
with respect to ranking architectures. So here the task was to rank 50 architectures. And you would see based on how long the learning curve is that was observed, how uh, good the, the spam and correlation is. And obviously you would expect, um, yeah, with growing learning curves, this to increase. And what we notice is basically, and that's probably not super surprising, um, that for very short learning curves, we saw the biggest gap because that's where we really could leverage the knowledge of transfer learning. Uh, where we could just based on the architecture encoding basically make already very good predictions. Um, obviously, ranking is one nice thing, but in the end, what we care about is finding the best architecture or at least a decent one. Um, so we just used a random neural architecture search and combined it with a couple of different early stopping methods. Um, we report here the regret, which is basically the difference between the solution um, you would get if you don't early stop compared to the one with early stopping and report GPU time in hours. Um, so yeah, the main takeaway here is basically that learning curve ranking has a low regret in most cases, um, but certainly has the lowest runtime. Um, so I have another, another ablation study here, which just yeah shows again what I mentioned earlier. So. Transfer learning is for this model super important because it has quite a few parameters. Um, so if you drop that part, and that would be like the red and the brown line. I'm not sure it's readable, um, but you would see that the ranking performance really drops. But also the importance um, of combining both pieces, like considering architecture and learning curve jointly, is certainly important, which is not too surprising, right? Um, the, the architecture would give you a lot in the beginning, while the learning curve would basically um, give you more information um, the longer you run that model, which is certainly also not surprising. Um, so what did we see um, so in the second part of the talk? Uh, I tried to yeah, present uh, some zero-shot methods and give you an idea how they work. Um, then we tried to look a little bit deeper into transfer learning for neural architecture search. And we looked there into different uh, methods. We, we saw some special NAS methods that would transfer knowledge. We saw the meta learning. And now just now we saw how we could even use it for early termination. Um, and what we in general saw is that, yeah, that's a very um, nice way of actually decreasing the computational effort. Um, even though we saw some progress in the recent years, I believe there's still some uh, some work to do, so I'm happy to see any new work. Um, yeah, concluding the tutorial, um, what we saw earlier is um, it just really presented us some common search spaces used, uh, various fission optimizers, mostly based on parameter sharing and differentiable architecture search. Um, we we saw like an extensive discussion on what problems occur with dots. Um, how we can overcome them and how people try to overcome them. And then I just now present you a deeper dive into zero shot and some trends or learning methods for NAS. Um, that's about it. I think I should be on time. Yeah. Um, so thanks a lot for your attention. Um, you can check out our survey paper if you want to. If you have questions, you can pose them now. Otherwise, I guess it's coffee break. Yeah, so uh, you, you presented a lot of different methods, so now it's a huge deal. But I think for many, it's sort of hard to see the forest for the tree. Where is this deal headed? What? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I could give that question back. Um, everyone might have their own answer to that. Um, it really depends, I think, on the application, what you really want to do. I think for most people out there, I would say, don't use NOS. I mean, that sounds a little bit weird <laughs> at this conference, but I think it's not really necessary, especially if you have all these pre trained networks. Just go for one of those. Um, you would 
that's, I mean, most people don't have the time to do that, as simple as that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's maybe not what you wanted to hear. <laughs> so if, um, yeah, if I were to pick one, we actually didn't discuss this um, in today's tutorial, but um, I think rather than using darts, it might be better to use the sampling based uh, one shot architecture search techniques that we discussed, like Dirichlet NAS uh, seems to be pretty good. Um, so one thing uh, that is still remaining is we'll have to see how well. So right now, all these algorithms just report the final best architecture perform. But if we'll have to see how well the training of this one shot actually occurs, my guess is the sampling based techniques will be more stable during the training rather than your usual darts based techniques. So maybe you can use that. Uh, as to where it is headed, uh, we're hoping that, yeah, training free NAS will take off and hopefully, like right now, it is very expensive to run these NAS algorithms for students. So maybe eventually they can also afford to run these experiments. But I agree, like hardware aware NAS, it's also something where you can gain still, which we also saw in the earlier tutorial. So there it seems like if you have the budget and compute and the manpower, that might be something you, you want to invest in. All right. Uh, I mean, I agree. Like, I mean, I would not rely on zero shot if I had to offer that as a product. <laughs> that would be a bit risky. But it seems a good idea combining both. Um, that you say, okay, I try to filter out some promising ones and then spend commute compute to verify that. And of course, we want to do that in an efficient way. And that can be with this transfer method, but that could be also with something more similar like Asha or whatever. Um, yeah, you, do you? Yeah, I think one of these papers, if I recall Econas, maybe they already tried to use these zero shot, uh, sorry, training free techniques, and they want to do early stopping or at least select a subset of networks rather than training all the networks. So that is one way to do it. This table is not allowed to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should go, go around. Yeah, Next table. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would not recommend it. So, I mean, if you don't know about it, then you would need some really great automatic tools, which would allow you to do it in a very simple way. Um, otherwise, I don't know. You, you you can do so many things wrong if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, I, I mean, oh. <laughs> especially, I mean, all these pre-trained network, right? If you don't have immense data, you, even with NAS, you will not beat that. You would need to find a new architecture. You need to pre-train it, and not everyone can do that. That could be a useful thing that you say we have all these 
I mean, we have so many pre-trained networks. Like if you look at uh, Hugging Face, how many different bird models they are trained on different domains. Yeah, picking one of those in a reliable way would be very useful, I think, yeah. We want to exploring that direction of uh, starting with the big, uh, even very big detail models. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on your perspective regarding the destination and like also a form of optimization problem to, to get to smaller networks that are maybe still fine tuned on a new target map? Um, but starting like maybe leveraging that, that these different models, right? Because that, that's certainly also an alternative to starting from scratch. So maybe so I understand what you're saying. You mean automating like distillation or I think there are some works doing that, right? There's automated pruning. And I mean, yes, that's certainly very important because the size of these models is a concern. Yeah, um, I'm basically curious because they say like, for most people, it doesn't make sense to run that. Right? You say, rather sort of start with the already very good models that are out there. And I'm wondering, I guess, if we assume that the three okay, like, the models are so amazing, um, but maybe they are not like as target specific already as I, as I want them to be, or maybe they should be something with the hardware better. Um, they, well, what, what open question, like potentially you see it in the paradigm that I mean, would probably investigate to that extent already. But I feel like there, there might be some still potential to go in the refinement and the distillation of. Like yeah, so I mean, I think like if you could come up with a reliable method which could go from, from these models, automatically prune them, make them smaller um, without sacrificing too much in accuracy, uh, I think that would be very useful, yeah. I mean, and you would like, as we saw in the previous NAS tutorial, also want to build that Pareto front in a way, which you automatically do in right. some sort when doing the pruning. Um, yeah, even though you don't have the hardware aware necessarily in there, you would still need to prune for every device. Um, but yeah, you can also solve that at the si same time. That would be a great paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um yeah i mean so that's uh i mean i think you could use both um zero shot i'm, I'm not sure i can trust it at the moment <laughs> so there's still research to do transfer something that might be easier especially if you're someone who basically I mean, we we have sometimes that thing that we sort of have ever changing data sets in our experiments, but that's mostly not what you would see in practice, right? There's someone has a model and would see sort of the similar data over and over again, and their transfer can be super efficient, right? Um, because you have done it a couple of times on a very related task, um, and then yeah, you just do it once again because you anyway update your model daily. Uh, or hourly, or I don't know what the update frequency is. Also, yeah, just to add one sentence, for example, I think in the zero shot techniques, if you see um, the correlation between all the ranking of the architectures is fairly poor, but in transfer learning, it's, it's a lot higher. So it's better to do transfer learning if you have the compute. If not, yeah. Um, one more question. Yeah. I think that's a follow up. No, it's getting hard. <laughs> Maybe. Can't hear. Yeah. You need to find the thinking part of the process to try to sell for these dead architectures to last for the whole start. Even for zero shot learning. Um, 
Did you catch that question? I think if I understand you are asking something about zero shot with respect to weights, right? Right. I think it is better to consider the weights. For example, I think there are some, some uh, zero shot architectures which actually look at how the network is initialized. So your uh, neural tangent kernel based uh, zero shot techniques, whatever are come, they do consider the weights as well. And I think it is good to consider the weights rather than not consider the weights and just the topology because, yeah, you wouldn't know how it will actually perform, right? Initialization is also important. So we didn't really hear your question, so not sure if you answered it. Okay. okay. All right, let's thank the speakers again.